If you call them, they will come. Pierre, Marie, Jean-Jacques. These are some of the names of our ancestors. From the French, to the Spanish, to the American, to the 1800s. Well, most of the times, Louisiana and New Orleans was a poor, poor city. But here, after the Louisiana Purchase, New Orleans expanded itself, becoming a principal city of the poor city, renamed the Queen of the South. Here in New Orleans, it becomes the domestic slave capital of America. America has now control of Louisiana, and the law states that you cannot import Africans internationally from Africa to America. So now you have Africans needed in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Texas, on the big cotton plantations of Louisiana and other sugar plantations. These workers will come and be supplied from Virginia, from North Carolina, from South Carolina. This is where you get the term sold down river from, where the Africans were sold down river. Some marched, some was walked, some had to walk from DC to New Orleans, where they will be resold here in New Orleans as the domestic slave trade capital. In the 1830s, because of the abundance of this industry, the Creoles of New Orleans built what was then the St. Louis Hotel, not a site of the Armani Royal Orleans Hotel. In this hotel, under a beautiful rotunda, full with marbles and hallways, they sold Africans in tuxedos and in luxury. This became the principal slave selling site of New Orleans, where they would sell Africans daily for six days a week. These Africans were funded by companies like Hewlett and Bright. Many of these companies are banking institutions today. So this is what made New Orleans wealthy. This is what made New Orleans rich. This is what built New Orleans after those fires. This is what funded New Orleans in the homes of the Garden District and of St. Charles Avenue of the 1800s. This property of black people being sold as chattel, mothers separated from children, fathers separated from their children. The, the industry is so lucrative where in Virginia, they would breed people to be sold down river to New Orleans. So this is where many of us, where if you read down the street in the historic New Orleans collection, where my last, I last saw my sister in Georgia, I last saw my brother in Virginia. My mother was sold to Louisiana, sold down river to New Orleans. So at this site, the St. Louis Hotel, where you can still see the word exchange, Exchange meaning slave exchange, etched in a stone, the last remaining remnants of that building. We honor those Africans who were sold here in this site, in this place, in the St. Louis Hotel on the old slave auction block, which is still situated in the Cabildo as a remembrance of what our ancestors endured, but what they overcame. When you walk around New Orleans, when you walk around the French Quarter, when you see the buildings and the ironwork, no one stopped to think about the Africans who built New Orleans. We're standing on the corner of Charters and St. Louis, in front of the old Pierre Mesperos, proudly established in 1788. Well, no one realizes that this former building was named the Exchange Building, or the Coffee Building, or the Cafe Building. And one of the things that it exchanged was human lives, African people. In the 1800s, the 1820s, and the 1830s, this building, where this plaque probably states that Andrew Jackson and his men planned the Battle of New Orleans, sold and trafficked it in Africans as they sold. Years later, as you see, when you went into this building, it was covered with artifacts from whips, chains, from torture items, and etc. And for a long time, this building was named the Slave Exchange Cafe. The Slave Exchange Cafe, where these artifacts was on proud display as their patrons ate among items that tortured Africans. Even on the second floor, you still see pegs and irons that was tied to the wall which held the enslaved people. So normally, as you walk through the French Quarter and you see plaques such as these, 
that talks about the selling of Africans on Charter Street, the business street of the French Quarter. We are here to honor and pay respect to those Africans whose names we don't know, whose names that we call out in respect and reverence. trying to figure out how I got myself here. See, the last thing I remember, I was driving down a bland Texas highway. I admit, I switched lanes with no notice. I was smoking a cigarette, which I knew, of course, would kill me eventually. I just never imagined for the life of me, or at least the life that used to be inside of me that it would lead to my death like this. I asked him, why am I being arrested? I asked him, why am I being arrested? I asked him, why am I being arrested? And then I asked him 11 more times. Last year, they told me a man in Staten Island killed himself with a noose that was made of police officers' arms. They said, they said he died after saying, I can't breathe, 13 times. I, can't breathe. I guess I should have known better. Should have known not to go all broken record, not to repeat myself like history. I should have known how quick they'd be to Victor White me, how they would stop, search, and arrest me, and still have the nerve to claim that I killed myself with something I smuggled in. For him, a gun. For me, a large pile of weed. 
They said I smoked my way into an early grave inside of one of their jail cells. But that I got so high, I mistook myself for a ceiling fan, fixed myself back into place and swung from the top of the same cage casket they had Khalif Browder in. But I guess somehow, somehow I was made to believe that blackness in this woman body would be different. I didn't realize the difference was in the silence about what happens to us. I got so used to hearing the premature eulogies of black men blared across CNN that I forgot about the family trees, the missing limbs that looked like me. So we seldom hear the funeral tears that black mothers cry over the kin they birthed in their own image. And I'll admit, I did not expect a single one of you to hear a sound that came from my mother's throat. It somehow, somehow in my death, she was given a megaphone mouth to mourn with. People spoke my story the moment I stopped being able to speak for myself. They marched in the streets with banners bearing my name, even though they had to Google other dead black women to hashtag beside it. And this is the place I keep trying to figure out how I got myself to. How I found a seat with my name at the tip of so many of your tongues. A seat so many of my sisters were denied when in death they were forced into the same margins they knew too well in life. I mean, there had to be something. Maybe, maybe I sang the Grim Reaper's tune in a pitch you could all hear. Maybe my voice had more baritone and you mistook it for one of the boys and decided to care. I mean, there had to be something different about my dying. Because I can't help but think, if I could just figure out what it is I did to make you all remember me. Even though I died in this black hole that we know as a black woman's body. And maybe, maybe there's something I could tell my sisters to do that would make you all remember them. Somebody call my name. Somebody sing my, my song. Somebody clean my house. And somebody tell my, my spouse, somebody tell my, my kids, somebody say a prayer, somebody pour my drink, and somebody call my name. Somebody call my, my name. 